We'll actually sequence the dog's genome and oh. the genome meaning all of the DNA. They, and then we can take the genomes from these dogs that live to be you know, much older and more healthy. And then we can compare them to the dogs that unfortunately got disease when they're young. Mm -hmm. And this is a really powerful way if we look at enough dogs to try to figure out what are those 100 or 200 genes that are affecting disease. One of the most negative things, if not the most negative thing about owning Dobermans is their health issues and their short and longevity as compared to other breeds of the same size. I had the chance a few weeks ago to go to a dog show up in Minnesota and combine that with a visit to the folks at University of Minnesota Vet School that are running the Disappearing Doberman Project. No one understands our concerns as owners as they do. That's why they have undertaken this tremendous project to study Dobermans over an extended period of time to try to reduce the number of health-related issues and increase longevity. We had planned on doing this interview inside, but at the last minute things changed and we had to go outside. And in Minnesota in late fall, it's uh, more than a little chilly. So you might see us from time to time kind of do a little shudder and you might even hear the little in our, our conversation. And you're also gonna hear some road noise and some wind noise. I tweet the audio as best I could to alleviate some of that noise and I did get rid of most of it, but you'll still hear a little bits of it now and again, especially in the beginning part of the interview. So just bear with me. You won't have any trouble understanding what's said and it'll get better as the interview goes along. So let's jump right in and meet the folks with the Disappearing Doberman Project. Welcome, and I am here today with Dr. Molly McHugh, and she is the professor um, of internal medicine and genetics at the University of Minnesota Veterinary College of yep. Medicine. Yep. Okay. Yep. And um, also Ashley Claggett, who is the project manager, and they are both here to speak today about the Disappearing Doberman Project which is being run at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. Why did you start the Disappearing Doberman Project? Yeah, it's a great question. Dobermans have one of the shortest lifespans of any of the domestic dog breeds. Depending on the study that you read, we know it's between seven and nine years, which is a lot shorter than dogs of the same size. Um, simply put, Dobermans don't live very long. Yeah. Uh, and they, this is in part due to the diseases that they have. In a recent study where they looked at, I think almost 2,000 Dobermans, they found out that the most common causes for Dobermans to die were dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, gastric dilatation and volvulus, or bloat, that Doberman people would be familiar with, um, some particular kinds of cancers, so lymphoma, bone cancer, and actually cancer of the blood vessels. Uh -huh. Which would be the mangiosarcoma, okay. correct? Yeah, and then also wobblers. Yeah, was one of the big ones. You know, they have other diseases that are pretty common and life limiting. One of them is hepatitis or liver disease. Okay, um, and they very commonly get autoimmune diseases. Those can be fairly serious. And then hypothyroidism is the last one. And that disease typically isn't life threatening, mm -hmm. but it definitely can interact with the other diseases that they get. For it, example, yeah. and, th and that falls under that autoimmune yes, issue. Yes, okay. yep, absolutely. Yeah. It has an autoimmune component, and actually, their liver disease does as well. Okay. Um, but there is a recent study that demonstrated that Dobermans that were hypothyroid actually can have a worsening of their signs if they have cardiac disease. So, while it ha causes issues on its own. Um, it also can interact with those other diseases. Yeah, so it's important. Um, what are some examples of the, the other autoimmune issues other than the liver and the thyroid that... Yeah, you know, it seems to be that there's lots of different ones that can happen in Doberman. Sometimes they have an autoimmune disease where their immune system ta attacks, say, their red blood cell or their platelets that are responsible for clotting. Um, they also um, can have some autoimmune skin diseases and, yeah. um, and some other things. And so for whatever reason, their immune system seems to be really picky. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, Unfortunately. Absolutely. So I, I know that when you look at the genetics of dogs, there's many breeds that have issues that are, are 
particular to that breed. I mean, right. we know that, you know, boxers also have issues, Rottweilers, golden retrievers. What was it about Dobermans in particular that, you know, started this project? This breed's very near and dear to my heart. I've grown up with it. My parents have been breeding for over 35 years. So there's definitely a very personal tie to it. And when you've been around the breed for a long time, you will unfortunately more than likely see one of these diseases once, multiple times, it just really depends. Um, on a personal note, I lost my heart dog to DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy, just yeah. over seven years of age. Um, okay. And <sighs> what we learn from this will be applicable to other breeds. This, it, That's it true. Yeah, yeah. And for the audience, I, I've known Ashley for years and years, even when she was just a little squirt <laughs> and she was showing in junior showmanship in Doberman. So when she says her family's been involved, I mean, she was showing the dogs that her family bred and finishing their championships. And now she's doing some of her own breeding yeah. under the same kennel name. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, she's definitely, her life is dedicated to the, to the dogs, just like mine is. Yeah. Yeah, similar to Ashley, I'm a Doberman owner and lover. I have um, multiple Dobermans of my own currently. And, and with my background in genetics and veterinary medicine, I really under, have understood the problems that were happening in the breed. And, and for me, almost three years ago now, um, my son's heart dog, Iris, um, was very sick uh, with liver disease. And fortunately for that disease, we caught it early and worked really hard and got her liver better. But right after her liver got normal, she developed lymphoma and died at six oh, years geez. of age. Aww. And it just said, okay, we need to do something about this. Yeah. And I have the know-how to do it. So I'm going to take up this fight, basically, in the breed. The, as an aside, tell me how, um, for Iris, you knew that there was something going on with her liver. That's, that's a great question. So I happened to have a, a graduate student at the time who was doing her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine and her PhD together, and she um, had one of Iris's litter mates. And they were, I guess, just not quite four years old, no, not quite five years old, and Layla presented with liver failure. Of course, her owner was on top of everything, right? Very sure. educated in understanding things. And she started throwing up on a Saturday. She did blood work and her liver was failing. So in some ways fortunate for Iris, the first thing that we did was check Iris's liver right? yeah. because I understood that it was genetic and her liver looked abnormal, but she still had normal liver function. Mm -hmm. and so we were able to try and treat her. We did treat her. And this is, this is blood work that would normally be done routinely every year whenever you go for your regular yep. veterinarian visit. Yep, so absolutely. So that's, that's another reason why it's really important to yep. do that annual blood work, even though it's, you know, it's a, some extra bucks. Right. It, it catches things early and gives you an opportunity to address them before they absolutely. get out of hand. And, you know, Iris was still six months out from her yearly blood work, and she mm. looked totally normal. So six months earlier, she was yep. fine. Wow. Yep. And... Um, you know, Layla also got yearly blood work, and so it just happened to be that it happens fast. It's mm -hmm. almost like liver disease. There gets to be a tipping point sometimes. Yeah. They look normal, they're happy, they're running around, and then, boom, you catch it too late because yeah. they're sick, because their liver is failing. So had Layla not gotten sick, mm -hmm. we might have waited another six months, or Iris could have gotten to the point where she got sick. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, I th and as we have personally talked, um, you know, outside of the camera that this breed is just so stoic. Um, they just don't let you know that they're sick until no. it's like almost too late. In some case, cases, it is too late right. to do anything for them for many right. of these diseases. Exactly. Um, so it, can you explain to me why all of these diseases that you mentioned earlier are so common in Dobermans? Yeah, I mean, Part of that, I think, is because when you compare Dobermans to um, other dog breeds, they are more inbred. And when you have a higher level of inbreeding, sort of in breed um, in general, you're more likely to have things like these genetic diseases that impact you. Okay. And so I know we've talked a little bit about inbreeding. You know, why does that happen? Mm -hmm. Why are they inbred? And, and really, what does it mean? 
sometimes yep. people ask that question. Yep, absolutely. And when we say that a dog is inbred or a breed is inbred, what we mean is that, say you took two random Dobermans okay. and you looked at their genetics and saw how related they were to each other or how many places in their genome or all of their DNA is shared, it'd be pretty high and much higher than say, if you picked two Labrador Retrievers at random yeah. and compared how related they were to each other. Now, you know, we know that inbreeding, Dobermans are not the only breed that has this issue and it's fairly common. And one of those reasons that it's common is that when we domesticated dogs, they went through something called the population bottleneck. And what that means is when we as humans domesticated dogs from wolves, we only picked a few individual animals. Okay. And then the big wolf population sort of came together into the smaller population that started the domestic dog breeds. So we call it a bottleneck really because of gotcha. the shape. And then for all domestic dog breeds, again, we had the early domestic dogs, they weren't breeds, mm -hmm. but then for each individual breed, they went through another bottleneck where the people who created that breed chose the individual or individuals that had looks what they want, had the characteristics or phenotype that they wanted okay. and then bred from there. Another problem that we have in our breed and other breeds is that this inbreeding continues to get worse over time. Mm. And part of that's due to something we call the popular sire effect. Okay. So if there's a single male that is really great and has wonderful characteristics, everyone breeds to him. Mm -hmm. Um, and that means his particular genes become overrepresented in the population and in the gene pool. And so we typically attribute this to the dogs, not because we're, we're biased the, against them. The, the males. The males, yeah. yep. Not because we're biased against them, but the, the simple biology is they can produce a lot more offspring than a single female. Gotcha. So they can have a much bigger impact. So whenever we're talking genetics, inbreeding doesn't specifically mean breeding like uh, sire to daughter or brother, sister. I mean, we're talking more broad, just, you know, we're looking at the overall genetics. I mean, we could have two dogs that, you know, one lives on the East Coast and one on the West Coast and they, on the pedigree, the three or four generation pedigree, they don't have any dogs in common. Mm -hmm. But whenever you look at them genetically, yeah. they almost look like their brother and sister. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. They look, you know, more common. And, and in the Doberman, you know, our, dogs in this breed have inbreeding as high as 30%, meaning that if you compare them to another dog or the average dog in the breed, they share 30% of their genetic wow. material. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, so we understand that our goal with what we're doing here is rather ambitious, but we have a, we have a vision of a healthier breed in the future. Mm. Um, we're targeting the four most common diseases, dilated cardiomyopathy, hepatitis, wobblers, and hypothyroidism. Okay. Depending on what paper you read, up to 58% of Dobermans are diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy. 20% mm. um, of Dobermans get hepatitis, and we see it more often in bitches. 10% or more end up with wobblers, and as a whole, the breed is 17 times more likely to get hypothyroidism. So these diseases are playing a big role on the health of our dogs. And, and I'm just curious, the, those numbers you quoted, are those specifically American dogs? Are they European? Are they worldwide? It's or? mostly I mean, worldwide. It depends on what paper you're looking at. Okay. Some of these are averages between the two. So, I mean, it, it's basically a problem worldwide Everywhere. regardless it's, of it's the breed or whatever right okay yeah. Wow. There, yeah there's not a type of doberman that you can get yeah. that is healthier than another type yeah. of okay. okay so regardless of a dog's breed what we know with pretty conclusive data now is that a dog's level of inbreeding is related to its lifespan and so what that means is that the more highly inbred a dog is on average the shorter its life will be okay and part of that is because inbreeding increases um, the frequency of genetic diseases. Mm. So DCM, hepatitis, wobblers, and hypothyroid, are, they're all what we call a complex genetic disease. Okay. So what do we mean by that? We're used to, as dog people, I think at this point, many of us are used to thinking about a genetic disease that's one gene, one mutation causes disease. Mm -hmm. Um, in complex genetic diseases, it's actually many genes and changes in many genes, could be a dozen, could be a hundred, wow, that cause disease. And 
we don't know how many genes it is for these diseases in Dobermans right now. But one, it's very complex than that. It's many genes, each one of them contributing a small amount to disease. Okay. And then on top of that, a dog's environment or their lifestyle, for lack of a better term, also can cause risk. So when I think about complex genetic disease or when I teach students about it, I think about it as an equation, sort of like genetic risk plus environmental risk. Okay equals how likely you are to get disease. So one of the important things in these diseases is that we understand how much is the genetics and how much is in the environment. That's a really important piece of information. If I said to you, Elizabeth, we looked at DCM and we understand that 10% of the risk of DCM is due to what a do dog has genetically and 90% is due to the dog's lifestyle. Mm -hmm you know, me and you and everyone else would focus on, well, what do we need to change in the lifestyle? What yeah. are those factors, right? We would say, okay, genetics is important, but less important. You know, conversely, if I said, well, 90% of DCM is genetics, yeah. and 10% of it's lifestyle, right? You would make different decisions in choosing dogs to breed. You would make different, you know, decisions about where we were gonna focus research yeah. or that money. But right now we don't know that for any of these diseases. Mm. There's been some great work done on little bits and pieces of these diseases, but that, in my mind, really fundamental question, we still don't know. So by environmental risk, just throw out some ideas of what that would involve. Yeah, um, I can give some examples. Okay. So with the liver disease in Dobermans, okay. there's a hypothesis and some data that suggests that copper in their diet might be incredibly important. Are there other uh, environmental factors other than diet? Yeah, I believe the answer is yes, certainly okay. there are, but I mean, honestly, we don't we don't yeah. know what they are. So, I mean, it, it could be, you know, exercise or okay. lack thereof, uh, the the chemicals that you're using in your house or, or exactly. treating your yard with, we just, right. we just don't know we right now. We just don't know right okay. now. Okay. Um, you know, and, and I think Ashley has a great hypothesis too about a dog's level of stress. And so when we're talking about lifestyle, I, Personally, Molly and I agree on this hypothesis of a dog's stress level throughout their life plays a role in the development of DCM and other diseases. But if you live in a constant state of stress yeah. over time, that wears you down. Absolutely. Um, so, and they're even down to traveling and training schedules. Like, is the way that we push our dogs sometimes to compete also playing a role? That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense because I, I keep reading multiple studies about the more stress that humans are under, the worse their health condition is. So that makes perfect sense that it would also affect canines the same way. So we've, we've talked about how there, we have all these missing pieces in this great big puzzle we're trying to figure out. I mean, what is the Do Disappearing Doberman Project doing to try to find those pieces and fit them in? So we have the Disappearing Doberman Project designed with two studies within it. We have the lifetime study and the early impact study. Um, many people are familiar with Morris Foundation's Golden Retriever lifetime study. And so our lifetime study is very, very similar. We wanna follow dogs starting at under one year of age. We're hoping to enroll at least 1,000 dogs and following them throughout the duration of their lifetime. So when they enroll, we'll collect a DNA sample, a cheek swab typically, and then we will do annual owner surveys, which um, we'll ask diet, exercise, travel, it's everything that falls within that lifestyle okay. of the dog. And then also asking for updates on halters and echoes and blood work. We just want to be able to track these dogs for hopefully 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. And at the conclusion of it, we want to be able to see the role of both the environment and that dog's genetics. and if they ended up developing any of the diseases or not, and kind of using that information to give us more pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, the, the Golden Retriever Lifetime Project has given us so many great studies um, that we can apply to all breeds, yeah, I think. Absolutely. But that, that's great that we're looking at it from the Doberman perspective yeah. as well. So the other part of the study is what we are calling the early impact study. Yeah. So as you can imagine, and we've learned with the Golden Retriever study, it's wonderful, but a lifetime study takes a long time. Mm. And we didn't feel like we have 10 plus years to wait for more answers. And so in the early impact study, what we're trying to do is collect 
um, information from dogs that either are diagnosed with DCM or wobblers or hyperthyroidism okay. or liver disease and enroll them in the study, ask similar questions about their diet and lifestyle and that sort of thing, but then also enroll dogs that are older and healthy. So looking oh. at our older healthy Dobermans and for all of those dogs, what we'll do is get a sample um, for DNA. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do with those DNA samples for the lifetime study and this study is we'll actually sequence the dog's genome. And oh. the genome meaning all of the DNA, the sequence from start to end um, in the dog. And then we can take the genomes from these dogs that live to be you know, much older and more healthy. And mm -hmm. we've got DNA from some dogs that are, you know, 13, 14. That's um, awesome. And then we can compare them to dogs that unfortunately got disease when they're young. Mm -hmm. And this is a really powerful way, if we look at enough dogs, to try to figure out what are those 100 or 200 genes yeah. um, that are affecting disease. But even before that, one of the first pieces of information we'll be able to get is what we call heritability. And that is that proportion that's genetic. Mm -hmm. versus the proportion that's in the environment. Okay. So looking at how heritable it is, how much genetics is responsible, and then identifying those genes, those are the two major goals of the early impact study. For both the lifetime and the early impact study, I mean, ultimately what we're, we're looking at is we want the world to be where, let's say you have a litter of puppies, mm -hmm. and we can take the DNA of those puppies and look at them and we can say, Puppy A has a very small genetic risk for liver disease, let's say. Okay. Um, but puppy B has a really large genetic risk for liver disease. Mm. So how do we use that information? What we do is that I can say to you or the dog's owner, hey, your dog has a, a risk for this disease, but we know these things we found out affect this risk, say it's diet or certain types of medications. We, we don't know what they are. But yeah. I can say, it's really important in this puppy to do blood work more than once a year. Okay. You know, after sure. a certain age. And it's really important, for example, um, one of our hypotheses is about diet and copper, that mm -hmm. you feed this dog a low copper diet for okay. its whole life. So then the idea is hopefully we prevent disease from happening. And mm -hmm. even in the rare instance that it happens, we understand better because we know the genes and we know the environmental factors, how to treat the dog. Yeah. You know, ultimately we want no Dobermans to ever have these diseases. Sure. But, you know, if they do have the disease, you know, the ultimate goal would be identify them at risk early, change their environment, um, screen them commonly. So if they get disease, we get it really early on, treat them effectively and ultimately have a longer life. Yeah. Well, the, what I see from that also would be that um, even if your dog's at high risk, then through implementing these environmental changes, you're at least prolonging the healthy portion, portion of their life. And Absolutely. they might get the liver disease at eight instead of four. Yep. Um, and then also because of the genetic part of it that you know the dog is going to be affected, then you know to remove it from being bred. Right. Exactly. So, okay. Exactly. So, Ashley, um, what can um, our audience and, and just Doberman owners in particular do to participate in this project? There are a couple ways that people can help us out. So, first off, we're going to need a lot of diligent owners who are willing to do the annual surveys and continue to update us and enroll their dogs into either portion of the studies, depending on where their dog fits, to enroll. You can find more information about it at our website for the Disappearing Doberman Project. And within that page, you'll be able to find the survey link. So I wanted to interrupt right here, just for a couple of minutes to show you this website and go over the individual pieces of what you're gonna need to do to participate in the Disappearing Doberman Project. So we're gonna sign in at z.umn.edu forward slash disappearing Doberman project. And this will take us directly to the university's website. So let's look first at our checklist for the survey. So the survey checklist is very important because it's gonna allow you to gather all the information that you're gonna need in order to complete the survey, and it will make the process 
much, much faster if you already have all of this information ready to go. Look at this participant instructions. Uh, again, it's going to encourage you to have everything on that survey checklist ready before you complete your survey. Most of you will not have had an opportunity to have your DNA collected previous to doing the survey. And then that's the case, then you'll automatically go to number four. So what will happen is once you complete your survey, then the Disappearing Doberman Project will send you a sample collection kit to swap your dog for DNA samples. And that kit normally takes about one to two weeks to reach you and it gives you information about what to do if you don't receive your kit within a timely manner. Now, if you're outside of the U.S., it will take up to three weeks to receive that. And then once you have your kit, um, it will give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to collect the sample and how to correctly submit it back to the Disappearing Doberman Project. These DNA sample swabs don't need any kind of special packaging. They don't need to be on ice or anything like that. They just, you know, pop in an envelope and go directly uh, via first-class mail to the university. So let's take a look at the submittal and consent form. The beginning is simply a synopsis of what the project is about. It does say that all dog and owner names will be kept confidential and that participation is voluntary. There are no risks unless you just get too aggressive whenever you're swabbing the inside of the dog's cheek and you, there are no costs for participating in the program. Of course, anybody can leave the study at any time, but naturally the hope is that all the participants will come back year after year after year to fill out these surveys, to update their dog's information for the duration of the project so that they can analyze and come back to us as owners with the most useful information on how to protect this breed. So then let's look at the actual survey itself. And it does mention that even with all your information from the survey checklist prepared, that it will take about 30 minutes for you to complete this survey. And that if you have to stop, you can come back, but if you do not come back within a 14-day period, you'll have to start the survey over again. So I'll remind you that, again, all the information that you're providing um, when it's tied to your name or your dog's name is kept totally confidential. And I've always said when it comes to anything Doberman health related, be it a diagnosis or results of health testing information, there's no good results, there's no bad results, there's no in-between results. What it all is, is information. So not only do we have to look at this information objectively, but we have to provide it to the project objectively as well. But don't hold back in your responses to the survey questions. Don't sweep things under the rug that you think might embarrass your dog, embarrass you, embarrass your breeder. To do any of that would actually be a disservice to the intent of this project and to the ultimate results we get out of that project. And now, let's get back to that interview. And you can fill out the survey. Once you receive the survey, we will send out a cheek swab for you to do on your dog and send back to us. So if you have a dog who does not necessarily meet one of the specific criteria, but you want to. And what again are those criteria? So for the lifetime study, under one year of age. Okay. And then for the early impact, we need dogs who are diagnosed with one of the four diseases. Okay. Or older healthy dog. If you want to fill out a survey and send your dog's DNA, you're more than welcome to. We will prioritize dogs who fit that criteria. But if you're really gung-ho about getting your dog's DNA whole genome sequence, then you can talk to us directly and we can, we can work with you. As far as the owner participation in the surveys, do you um, have an idea right now, like how long is it gonna take them to fill out those surveys every year? So through the test runs we've done, somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes, that's if you have your documents ready. We do ask, like I mentioned earlier, for updated health testing, blood work. There is on our website, we call it our survey checklist. Okay. So it just gives you a reminder of, hey, we're gonna be asking for your blood work and your Holter and your Echo. Yes. 
So we recommend people to gather those documents, have them ready, and then if you have those ready and you sit down, it should take you somewhere between the 20 and 40 minute mark. And and these the the health testing that you're asking for is something that they should routinely do anyway every yes. year. So it's not asking them to pay out anything extra yeah, yeah. Uh, either to the university or to their vet to have anything special done. Additionally, outside of enrolling your dogs, this study needs donations. We always have an active donation link. It's always tax deductible. Uh, currently, we're about to run a crowdfunding page to buy 10 Holter monitors for the project. Mm. So that way, study participants will have access to the Holters. And, uh, and the Holters are uh, a 24-hour EKG, basically. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, and then also, we'll, we more than likely will always have ongoing fundraising needs. Um, have you taken a look budget-wise at you know what you think ongoing the, you're going to need donation-wise to continue the project to fruition? Yeah, it's a great question. As Ashley said earlier, this project is really ambitious. Mm. When you add it all together, we're hoping to have sequenced the genomes of at least 4,000 Dobermans. Wow. Um, and while that's part of the cost, the other part of the cost is actually analyzing all that data what Ashley gets to do. <laughs> um, so when we have sketched out and drafted out a budget for this project, it's about a million dollars wow. over the lifetime of the project. And, you know, we are funding that in a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. One is um, we're writing grants. For example, the Doberman Pinscher Health Foundation has just given us a grant uh, oh. towards this project. And we have grant requests in to um, the AKC's Canine Health Foundation okay. and to the Dover and Pincher Club of America. So hopefully Perfect. that will help um, with some of the funding. The University of Minnesota, through some internal grants, has helped us get the project nice. started. But really, not only do we need people to help by participating and help by spreading the word, but also if they're able to, um, help by donating towards the project. Yeah, and I'm sure just even small amounts, I mean, the, if there's enough of us, which, you know, right. there's a lot of people out there that love Dobermans that, right. you know, when it adds up, it adds up. It does, absolutely. And, and just to give, I guess, some context, right now when we go um, to sequence a single dog's genome, okay. um, that cost is about $150. It's pretty remarkable when you consider that 10, 15 years ago, that would have been millions of dollars. Absolutely. So, and how many genes are we talking about when we're sequencing a one individual dog. Yeah, our estimate and what we know is there's about 22,000 different genes in the dog's genome um, and about three billion of what we call base pairs. So oh, remember, oh, oh, oh. And you remember back um, <laughs> to biology where you learned about the A, C's, T, E's yeah. yeah. that make DNA. The dog genome has about three billion of them. Oh my gosh. And that's why a significant part of the cost is the data analysis. We have to Absolutely. use a supercomputer. So we literally log into this giant high powered computer at the University of Minnesota yeah. and then um, run a lot of analyses and computer programs to figure it out because it's just not feasible to actually look at those along the computer oh, <laughs> and figure out where the changes are. <laughs> so how is the Disappearing Doberman Project different from other genetic studies that have been done, done on Dobermans in the past? Yeah, um, in one way, it's it's just bigger. We're doing okay. more and we're being more ambitious. Um, there are some really great projects that have happened and people have participated in, mm -hmm. um, both for the individual diseases. Um, the Doberman Diversity Project may be yeah. um, something that the audience has heard about. Um, those have given us great pieces of information mm -hmm. and we are building on what has been done before. I think one difference is the number of dogs, like I mentioned, and also that we're sequencing the dog's entire genome. We're not just looking at a small set of genetic okay. markers. We are literally looking at everything. Yeah. Part of that is because the technology is just better than it was mm -hmm. even five years ago. Absolutely. More affordable. Um, but we really will have more information about the dog on the genetic side. And then with the surveys that Ashley's worked on and we've developed, mm -hmm. we're going to have more information about the environment um, than sure. ever has been collected before. And as Ashley mentioned, when people enroll their dogs for either part of the study, we're going to send them a survey once a year to just update us mm -hmm. um, to keep the information updated. And that's and the, that's going to be so important for those owners that have signed up 
to follow through Absolutely. year to year. It's not going to do you much good if they figure right. her out after three years. Exactly, uh, because you know they may enroll the dog today and it's healthy, but if that changes, mm -hmm. and we're assuming as we're doing this comparison that that dog is healthy, you know that misinformation can really impact our ability to find the answer. Certainly, so, absolutely. Uh, that mm -hmm. follow-up piece, I think, is going to be really critical, as you said. Yeah. Um, and something that is going to give us a little more power than what's been done before. Take a bow. Good job. <laughs>